Hello again, students. Today I want to talk about basically covering the material in Chapter 6 of our book Rothwell and talk about introductions and conclusions or what I call bookends. Bookends um, help define a speech. They create a bracket. They create a, a setting aside of a particular um, of a particular issue, right? They define the event of the speech. So it's interesting that this is kind of the thing of public speaking is your communication morphs into a particular. Uh, a particular heightened level of culture, heightened level of intentionality, heightened level of of um, performance. Right, uh, a speech is set aside uh, or set apart from regular communication by these two bookends. Right, the introduction and the conclusion. And they help uh, the audience kind of realize that for these few minutes, here is a topic that bears attention. And so we're going to talk about how um, this attention is asked for, is deserved, and is um, used to the best effect possible. All right. Uh, I wanted to use the illustration of uh, an epistle. So in the Bible, we have the epistles um, that different ones of the apostles had wrote. And they gave a, even though they may have, you know, personal letters and personal communication with individuals, here they set aside a specific piece of rhetoric in order to um, illustrate um, or to communicate a particular point. So we can read here Jude, the book of Jude, and it's only one chapter, right? So verse 1, 2, and 3. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So there's several elements of this introduction that we can use and kind of analyze and then see how it um, relates to speech. Okay? So let's dive right in. So the speech or the introduction, first of all, is trying to gain attention. Well, let's use it. Um, I'm not going to use this exact order, first of all. So you see the fourth thing, give your credentials. In the book of Jude, you see that that's the first thing he did was he defined who he was. Now, obviously, we know who he was. If you're writing a business letter, right, you put your name and your own address at the top and define for the company that or the person that you're writing who you are and who you represent. Jude does the same thing. Uh, a lot of times when people begin a speech, they give their name. Hey, my name is Josh Rogers. I am a coach and speech uh, teacher at William Carey. However, as we talked about earlier, um, if somebody looks at, well, Connor Neal in one of those videos on introduction talked about 
if if they have a pamphlet or a handout or something in front of them that already tells your name um, and tells a little bit about who you are, then your establishment of credibility is going to be a little bit more subtle, right? If you are a preacher at a church, someone else has made the introduction for you, or you are a regular and everybody knows who you are, your introduction is going to be a little bit more um, streamlined. But you are wanting to establish who you are, what your relationship is to the topic and to the person. In this case, right, he is a servant of Jesus Christ, a brother. And who is he talking to? He's talking to all who are called. He begins with a benediction, right, with a blessing. He clarifies the purpose. The purpose is that what he is about to say are words of life, and hopefully these words will, will add to or fulfill the mercy, peace, and love um, that is being sent, right? It's, those aren't just empty words being said. Like, for example, in our modern day, we have a greeting that we use, hello, H-E-L-L-O, and it comes from the old English word, your health, your health. It's a, it was a blessing, it was a greeting, it was, you know, I hope that you are well, I hope that everything is good with you. Um, that would be a great way to um, re-emerge with um, a, a, a conscious, intentional way of communicating to people that you actually care about their health. How are you doing? Of course, usually when we say, how are you doing, we really don't want to hear how people are doing. We um, merely say it out of custom. But hello meant your health, right? It, meant, it came from the word health, your health. And even um, the word health and salvation comes together. Um, for example, people, whenever they... In, back in the olden days, whenever there were ki kings in the world, they would say, God, save the king, or the health of the king. Right? The words save and health were interchangeable. It has to do with a person being complete, being whole, being um, in the picture of their prime, right? Body, mind, and soul. Uh, so you have this, you have this gaining people's attention, right? You have this wish or this objective um, for them. You are sometimes we use different ways of gaining people's attention. Some a shocking fact, a little story that creates a connection between two people, or um, asking a question that people have like in the back of their mind. Right now, obviously, if you um, have done your research, then you know something that people want to know about. And you clarify that purpose, right? You define your objective. You have a purpose. Your purpose is for them to uh, become educated, become aware, um, become more careful and there's a uh, some there's a great little question checklist here on page 90 in the book that you can as you are thinking through your purpose helps you think through how to make it um, as strong as possible is your purpose statement concise and precise. Concise means that it says everything that it needs to say but doesn't have extra fluff words in there, right? Concise means it's simple to the point. Precise means that it um, 
that it kind of hits all of the targets that it needs to hit, right? It it has all of the sides, all four sides, um, well blocked out. Is your purpose statement phrased as a declarative statement? Um, now, again, like I said, are we asking a question? Are we making a declaration? I personally believe either one is appropriate, but as a declarative, you are saying, in this speech, I want you, even if you don't say it in these words, um, you are clarifying to the audience, I want you to come away with X, Y, and Z. Right? You're letting them know, what is this? Is your purpose statement free from colorful language? Like, like, are you going to use euphemisms? Are you going to use catchphrases? Are you going to use lots of adverbs and adjectives? No. Those are not essential in making that clear, straightforward, pointed purpose statement. Is your purpose statement more than a simply a topic? You're not just announcing the topic, but you're announcing how you will deal with that topic. Okay? And is your purpose statement practical? Will the listeners get something out of it? Of course, this goes back to the principles that we have been establishing as servant speakers. We want to minister, right? What is, what is the ministry effect that this speech is going to have for your um, for your audience, and then give them a preview of your main points. So, getting their attention, clarifying the purpose, showing how important. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Showing how important. So, obviously, the fact that you are standing up and speaking about this topic means that you believe it is important. It's very important to you. You can see you have a vision, uh, you have information that you've gathered, you've had experiences that you have experienced, and all these things build up this body of knowledge that's extremely important. However, your audience may not have gone through that same process. And so as a speaker, you have to bring them along through that process, right? You have to show to them this is an important topic. Why is this an important topic? And you have to accomplish all five of these goals, like, boom, right up front. Let's go back for a second to Jude. Jude kind of walks us through his process of realizing how important his letter is. Look at verse 3. He said, Beloved, although I was very eager to write it to you about our common or mutual salvation, he wanted to explore salvation, explore redemption, what God has done for us. As he began digging into this topic, something else emerged to his view that he felt was took even more precedence and was therefore extremely important. In fact, it was so important, he says, I found it necessary. Right? Hopefully, if you're speaking, it's because you are meeting a need. You are addressing a need, either in your own self, in others, in society, and you are serving Christ through addressing this need. He found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So... What he expected would be um, a 
preaching to the choir, right? Talking about salvation, how important and how precious it is, how we are enjoying it, how it touches on um, our daily life as well as our future happiness, he realized not everybody values faith the way he did. There is this need to overcome obstacles, to overcome um, criticisms, to overcome uh, questions, to overcome enemies of the faith. And he realized that what to him was a precious gift, having been given him, right? Uh, a common gift, a, a gift that was mutual for him and for everyone who was saved. A gift given them by Christ. A gift transmitted to them through the apostles and the pre, of the pre, by the preaching of the word. He realized that not everybody realized, everybody else realized how precious it was. And so he says, contend. Appreciate this. And so this helps us to kind of see how important this topic is. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that the only topic of importance is speaking of salvation. We should use whatever platform we have to speak about salvation. But there are many things in life that are important, that are needful, that are necessary. And so hopefully the, the messages that you're bringing have this importance, this weight, this consideration that is going to um, propel them forward. And really, it's this importance that, in, in a way, is going to help you overcome your um, stage fright because you realize that it is more important for you to get this message across to others than how you personally are feeling or what your personal emotions are. And so getting caught up in the topic that you're talking about is going to be essential for your success in speech communication. So finding that, um, that showing that importance, and then of course, um, previewing the main points. By this time, um, this is assuming, and we're going to get into this and develop this more later, this is assuming you already have an outline, that you have an established flow of thought. But I, I, I stuck that in there. It's in the book. Um, I want you to be aware of it. The introduction, sometimes it's easy to go ahead and write your purpose, explain why it's important, and this will help you get into the research that is necessary to developing the rest of the speech. So don't skip that step. Be sure to get a strong, uh, a strong introduction. The, the next thing, or the other bookend, the other end of the thing, is every bit as important, and that's the conclusion. Let's look uh, again at our example passage there in Jude. The last few verses, he kind of winds down. He's got two, three main sentences that kind of bring us to bring it down, right? First of all, verse 2021, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. What is our goal? 
what is our objective. A lot of times whenever I'm preparing to preach, um, I believe very strongly in expository preaching. I, I preach through the passage. Sometimes I will do a larger overview of a larger section of, of Scripture. If I'm doing a book study, for example, I will um, I want to read through the whole book and kind of get in my mind what is the flow of the rhetoric all the way through from beginning to end. But I especially hone in on this the end. What did he hope to accomplish by the end of the speech? By the end of the letter? By the end of the discourse? By the end of the rhetoric? What was his goal? And if we can if we can get in our minds what the end objective is, then that will help us kind of trace the route through the rhetoric. Okay? So, the same is true in your speech. Um, I'm not saying that your introduction or your conclusion will be in its final form if you start there. But I do think that you should have a rough draft of your introduction and your conclusion so that you know where you're going. Right? So that you define, okay, I want to start with this and I want them to understand this by the time they get here. Again, you're going to have to go back and edit that at some point. Keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So, the building, the holding, the keeping, and the waiting. This sounds like a great metaphor for <laughs> coronavirus quarantine, right? Build up your immunity system, build up your stock of of groceries at home so that you can survive through the next couple of weeks living at home, staying at home, not getting out much, um, keeping the essentials as essential, right? Faith and prayer. Um, keep yourself steadfast in the love of God knowing that He is overwatching everything. He is the one keeping us. Um, keeping ourselves steady in this belief and agreement that He is a God of love. And then, sometimes there's just that element of waiting, right? Things are going to get better in the end. And so we have much to look forward to in the future. We are going through privation or through... Um, challenges now but those will be short-lived and will come out to a better end and have mercy on those who doubt so not only for yourself but next serving your others right have mercy on those who doubt save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear hating even the garment stained by flesh And then, obviously, the ultimate relationship is vertical to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all, all time and now and forever. Amen. Not that anything that we do or say is going to alter who God is, but He is worthy of us to remember who He is and to engage with Him because He invites us to be part of the majesty and the glory and the dominion and the authority that He is establishing in His kingdom. 
And as he is establishing his kingdom, and as he is inviting us to be part of his kingdom, we operate in that context. So you see here uh, a conclusion, right? And this conclusion is supposed to connect the dots. Um, he had gone through many things. He had talked about false teachers. He had talked about problems. He had talked about... Um, uh, previous judgments that had been come upon the world. He talked about um, bad blood and bad relationships in churches, especially in their their feasts or their Lord's Supper, right? Their feasts of charity. Um, he talked about. You know, even bringing up in some evidence that we had never heard before about Enoch, the seventh from Adam, and the prophecy that he had made. Evidently, that was um, historical. It was preserved in some places, but it wasn't part of Holy Scripture until Jude brought it and included it here. Even though we know... There is a sense in which we understand the significance of, of Enoch even from the little bit that we hear about him in the book of Genesis, right? But all these things that he's dealing with brings us back to tying it down, right? Our relationship, um, you know, of our self, our relationship being healthy, our relationship to our neighbor being what it should be, and uh, and ministering to them, and then our and then our focus on who God is and what He is accomplishing, and the kingdom that He is building. All these three things, connecting those dots, and then restating the main points. I put here, wrap it up like a Christmas present. Uh, one of um. As a young preacher, and even still, I'm not uh, discounting it at all, but as a young preacher, one of the greatest rhetoricians to read behind was the preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Um, many, if not most, of his sermons are available online. You can, you can read them. You can look at them. He was a master of simple, straightforward organization and outlining. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about that later. But um, one of the principles that he presented in speaking was tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. Right? You've got your introduction, tell them what you're going to say, You've got your main points, uh, and then tell them what you said. Re, re hit it. And he would. He was very careful about um, giving clear signals about when one point was finished and the next point was started. Right. Each main point was packaged carefully was wrapped up, had a front end and a back end. Um, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but having that in your mind and then communicating that to your audience so that they can track with you, right? Your introduction, tell them what you're going to say. I'm going to cover this, 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 and this. You cover those four points. And then in the end, you said, and remember, we covered this, 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 and this. You can see this in uh, advertisement on TV. Even if the spot, even if the uh, advertisement spot is only 15 seconds, most of the time, they're going to quote and they're going to retell their phone number and their website 
at least three times. It's the, it's the practice of threes, right? That number is 1-800-XYZ-XXYZ. Again, 1-800-XYZ-XXYZ. And don't forget that number again is 1-800-XYZ-XXYZ. By stating up front what it is, by hitting each of the points as you go along, and then restating the main points at the end, you are creating this um, internal structure so that the, your audience has pegs in their mind on which they can hang um, the information. Now, um, people who are expert rhetoricians and even neuroscience shows that you have to have associations for you to retain information. If information doesn't have a place to go, then it is forgotten. It is lost. Right? And so you have to be aware that your, your audience needs a structure. They need cubby holes in which to stick their information. They need a filing system if you will. And each main point is like a file folder. All right, this information goes in this file folder, this information goes in this file folder, and this information goes in this file folder. And each one of those files um, has a particular place, a location. They have a progression. And so giving that outline up front and then concluding with that outline um, at the end creates a, um, a, a structure that is easy for them to locate and to store that information in their mind so that they don't soon forget your speech. And then, last of all, finish strong. Have a strong dynamic. Don't give everything up front right? Pace yourself. Um, I don't know uh, any of y'all enjoy music. I, my wife is a jazz musician and um, I really enjoy music. I really enjoy jazz music particularly. In a jazz piece, th there is a what is called improvisation. Everybody in the band, okay, I'm, I'm thinking of a combo or a band. Everybody starts out and plays through what we call the head, right? It's the set of progression. Um, it starts somewhere, goes somewhere, ends somewhere. And then you get to the middle part, and each person gets to take um, a solo, right? The guitar takes a solo. The saxophone takes a solo. The bass takes a solo. The drums take a solo. And then you all come back together and you play the head again in order to conclude it. Right? Now, even within each of those solos, you're given a handoff from the person before you. Right? They said something in their solo. Now, it was a personal expression, it was a personal statement, but the piano hands it off to the saxophonist. The saxophonist doesn't just go off on his own tangent all by himself. He actually is going to take what the pianist handed to him, and he's going to elaborate on it. He's going to take parts of it and explain it further. He's going to um, carry it... But he doesn't put that all up front in his first five seconds of his solo. No, he, he starts out, he restates, he elaborates, he builds to a climax, and then he concludes strong and gives a strong handoff to the bass. Okay? Pacing. That's what that's called, right? That's called pacing. And so... 
um, in your speech, you want to think about starting in at the beginning, progressing through your speech, but don't give all your goodies out up front, right? Save back a little bit that, that special nugget to conclude strong. Remember, let's go back to um, to J Jude. What is it? How does he, he conclude with man? He concludes with acknowledging the kingdom of God and saying that the kingdom of God is eternal. Right? It was before all time. It is now present, and it will continue forever. Talk about kind of a mind-blowing statement that shows that his contribution, his short 25 verses, speaks to this everlasting context of faith. I mean, talk about knocking it out of the park, right? He concluded strong. He gave a strong witness to the existence of God, the importance of God, the, the work that God's involved in, and even our small, maybe insignificant, and yet significant because it is part of God's work. Right? God is the one who gives us this significance, who makes our contribution significant because we are involved in his great work. And so, just as Jude finished strong, we need to finish strong. Uh, in our book, it gives us a couple of, um, of little pointers. They call it sizzle, don't fizzle. Right? Sizzle, don't fizzle. Let the end of your speech be just, uh, just as, um, just as strong and continuing on carrying it out to to that final moment. Right, bring it home when you when you when you make that final hit with the hammer on that nail. So speaking. And the main points of your speech is like hammering a nail, right? You have this big old spike here, and you're and you're putting the nail here, and each main point hammers that nail home, hammers that nail home, hammers that nail home, and you want your conclusion to boom, seat that nail nice and flat and smooth so that it doesn't budge, right? So your conclusion should be strong like that. Boom! Seat that thing right down there. All right? Um, looking forward to putting this up online, and I will be back in touch with you um, in our next chapter in which we deal with organization. Take care. Until next time.